Father, this morning, we recognize your greatness, your goodness, your truth, and your power. But we also confess our weakness, our brokenness, and our failures. And we ask that in your strength and in your power that you would change us, that you would heal us, that you would restore our lives as we encounter your person and your grace. So God, meet us in this place. Speak in power to our hearts and change us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, And when I say Bible, I mean if you've got a phone, you've got an iPad, you've got some kind of device that has it on there, that's perfectly fine. Uh, If you don't have a Bible with you, there's some in the pews around you. Feel free to grab one of those and use it. If you don't own a Bible and you want one, feel free to take one of those because we want you to have the Word of God and to use it in your life on a regular basis. Uh, Last week we kicked off our Family Feud series talking about marriage and how to have a joyful, happy home. And and, uh, where there's marriage, well, there's also divorce. And and divorce is one of those subjects that, if we're honest about it, the church has fought over. We've had a family feud going on for generations about how we relate to this subject, how we think about it, how we deal with it. And and since I grew up in church, and I grew up in... in, uh, uh, biblical, legalistic, kind of controlling churches, uh, I've seen crazy stuff happen over the subject of divorce. Uh, For instance, uh, the church I served in seminary, uh, they they just couldn't handle the idea that someone could actually get a divorce. I was the interim pastor, and uh, there was a lot of people in the church who wanted me to be the pastor. I applied for the job, and the search team told me that they weren't going to hire me to be the pastor because I let a divorced man preach on a Sunday night. He happened to be a member of the church. He happened to have a, or be in seminary working on his doctorate in biblical studies. And his wife was an employee of the church. And yet because I let a divorced man preach, they actually use the term, he has two living wives. And I go, I'm pretty sure that polygamy is outlawed in the state of Kentucky. And, uh, and, and, but they, they just couldn't get past that. Uh, the church that Chet and I served at together in Albany, Georgia, uh, they, they, if you were uh, divorced, you couldn't be a pastor, you couldn't be a deacon. Uh, in fact, if anybody in your family was divorced, that, that applied. Uh, there was a young man that uh, was a peer of ours, that was a godly young man, loved Jesus, loved people. But because he married a divorced woman, he was disqualified from being a deacon. They didn't let him serve. And, and, and I've known a number of pastors that would not marry someone who had been divorced. They just said, no, we're not going to do it. So today we're going to talk about divorce. We're going to talk about what God says about divorce. So we're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, beginning in verse 10. And I want to walk through this passage and, and pause and talk a little bit about the, the verses. And, and then after we read the passage, I want the big picture. I want to talk about the big picture, what God really says in his word about divorce. So here we go. Paul says to the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband. But if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce his wife. Now, now, obviously God isn't for divorce, and so he gives this directive, this command. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but in there he mentions something about remain unmarried, remain single. And and again, I want to call your attention to this whole passage. If you were here last week, Chad talked about that in, in context a little bit more. But Paul's bias when he's writing to the church is this. Stay single and serve God with 100% of your time. Stay single. Whether you've never been married, whether you're divorced, whether you're a widow or widower, stay single and give yourself to God. And that's Paul's first choice. But he also says at the very beginning of this chapter, if you can't control your lusts, if you're not called to a life of singleness, then what does he tell you to do? Get married. And that's the overarching principle that applies here. But he says, hey, I'd rather you stay unmarried if you can. Now, he goes on to say in verse 12, To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Now, the situation is this. Again, you've got first-generation Christians, people who have met Jesus, and they've gone home and told their spouse, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus now, and their spouse was not happy. 
And Paul says, look, just because they're not happy, just because they won't follow you in Christ is not a reason to leave them. In fact, how else are they going to meet Christ other than your testimony, your witness, your evidence of life change showing in, their, in your life is going to draw them to Jesus Christ and so that they can make that personal commitment to Christ as well. He says, how else is that going to happen? Your life is a testimony to them. It goes on, verse 15. But if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. A believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Do you notice what he says? If the unbeliever leaves, if you are abandoned because you become a Christian and your spouse doesn't like that and they walk away, Paul says, look, that's acceptable. That's okay for you to get a divorce in that situation. He goes, look, this is uh, an exception to the rule of don't get divorced. So uh, what I'm trying to say is when we look at this, I want you to see the whole context of Scripture as we we examine this subject. And there's three things I want you to know today as we talk about divorce. First one is God's plan for marriage is one man, one woman, one lifetime. This is God's plan for marriage. One man, one woman, one lifetime. And because we're talking about it being God's plan for marriage and coming out of Scripture, you need to know this applies to followers of Jesus Christ. This applies to followers. So if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that He died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ, then this is God's plan for your life. One man, one woman, one lifetime. He says, this is how I want to bless you. He he said it from the very beginning when in the garden he said, it is not good that man should be alone. And so he created woman to be with him and created the institution of marriage in order to bless us. Do you realize the very first thing that God created after the world was this idea of family as it exists? And so God says, I want to bless you. I want to bless your children. I want to bless this world through this gift of marriage. Now, what's interesting is that every sociological study, whether it's done by Christians or done secular, supports God's plan for marriage. In fact, every sociological study says that the very best environment, the healthiest environment for children is to raise them in an intact family of origin. Mom, dad, and kids. That's the best setting to raise healthy kids. And it doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not, that is true. And people would agree with that. Hey, if I want to give my kids a chance, if I want to bless them, I want to raise them in that home. So God's plan for marriage is to bless us, all of us, our children, our families, and our society. That's why the directive to stay married is so strong. Because God says, I want to bless you. You're not going to be blessed if you don't stay in your family, in your marriage. That's the plan A. That's God's best for us. I say that knowing that we live in a fallen world. Knowing that ever since the garden, when our very first forefathers decided to rebel against God, every relationship in this world has been damaged. Every relationship has been broken, has been tainted by sin. And so now, instead of being the intimate, loving partners that God designed us to be for each other in marriage, what do we have? Men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and God knows where our kids are from. And... uh, (laughs) I'll let you discuss that over lunch. But uh, God wants to bless us in marriage. We have to start with that understanding. The second thing I want you to know is that our rebellion results in brokenness. Um, We reject God's authority and plan. That's what we've been doing as people since the beginning. We decide that we know better than God, and so we'll do it our way, and we fail to obey. We choose defiance, and the result is that our relationships our relationships of pain and betrayal and anger and sorrow and frustration. And the brokenness in our lives through rebellion spills over into our families, and so we experience marital brokenness, a divorce. That's the result. It's a direct result of sin in our life and our choices and our rebellion against God. And and we need to understand, and a lot of you already know, the Bible says that God hates divorce. You ever hear that one? I heard that a lot in the churches I grew up in because they wanted to marginalize people who were divorced. And so they said, hey, you know what? You get a divorce. You're now a second-class Christian because God hates divorce. They didn't actually say that. They just lived it. 
There was shame, there was guilt, that there was all kinds of, uh, of, of separation that happened because now you were no longer living out God's best, and so God hates divorce. And, th and that was said oftentimes angry and firmly. You know what's interesting? What's interesting is that the Bible says God hates lots of stuff. And we didn't treat people who did those any differently. Because, you know, God hates the proud. He says he hates proud, haughty eyes. And, in fact, Scripture says God is opposed to the proud. So you got to check your pride and see where you're at. Scripture says that God hates uh, gossiping lips. <laughs> Whoops, there goes the prayer ministry. Uh, <laughs> but no one ever stood up and said, God hates gossips. You know, just hates divorce. God hates people who sow discord among the brethren. Wow. <laughs> the word Baptist means discord among the brethren. Uh, the, uh, not really, in case you're wondering. And see, all these things, we overlooked those and we treated somehow divorce differently. God hates divorce. And then here's the other thing. No one ever explained why God hates divorce. Do you ever think about this? Why does God hate divorce? Because the very best way he wants to bless you beyond Jesus Christ and being your Savior is giving you a loving, intimate relationship called family. That's why God hates divorce. He gave us this gift of marriage, this gift of relationship where he wants a husband and wife to share uh, passionately, intimately as partners in life. And when we get divorced, what we're saying is, God, here, you gave us this gift and we broke it. And when we break God's gift of, of marriage and family and intimacy, then, then we are inviting pain and destruction into our lives and into our families. And we are damaging us and we're damaging our children. And that's what God hates. He hates to see his children invite pain into their lives. He hates to see us self-destruct. And so when you say that God hates divorce, yes, he hates divorce because of the pain and suffering that sin causes us to have. Do you realize that at the beginning of every relationship, nobody wants divorce? Nobody ever plans on divorce. Look, people don't come into my office and go, hey, pastor, we want you to marry us. We think that five or ten years from now we'll get divorced, but we want you to go ahead and marry us. No, people come into my office, they're holding hands, and they're looking like, you know, goo-goo eyes into each other's face, and they're like, oh, we love each other so much. And I go, well, why do you want to get married? Oh, because we're in love. It's going to be forever. Sometimes I want to get up and slap them and go, would you open your eyes and walk in this a little more realistically? And, and so every, and you know what? Everyone I've ever talked to is sincere at that point. From the, from the marriages that have lasted a week to the marriages that have lasted uh, a lifetime, they're all sincere when they say, we want to get married, we want to stay married forever. So nobody ever wants to, to step into that pain and heartbreak and failure of divorce, but that's where our rebellion leads, to divorce. But understand, it's not just the divorce that, that is the rebellion. We do relationships rebelliously. From the very beginning, we start poorly, so why would we expect it to end well? You ever think about that? We rebel in the way that we date. God, we know that you tell us we should, you know, conduct our, our lives in morality and stuff, but we live in a hookup culture, and, and so we'll start off with casual intimacy, and we'll hope that that grows into something that's like really healthy intimacy. Why would we expect that? So we rebel in the way that we date. We rebel in the way that, well, the, the values that we use to embrace or choose a partner. Do you know there's only one direct command from God about marriage in Scripture as a Christian in terms of who God wants you to marry? Other Christians. Do not be unequally yoked. And yet time after time, people come in and say, yes, but we're in love. I know that's not what Scripture says, but we're in love. And we choose to disobey God's directives, and we wonder why our marriages aren't blessed. We, we rebel against God in the way that we communicate with each other. Within our homes, within our families, you know, God said, speak the truth in love. And he meant that for everybody, beginning at home, and we usually get about half of that right. Because we're really good with the truth when we're angry, aren't we? But we're often not very loving. And we destroy our families with our words. We rebel in our lust, in our perversion, our pornography, our immorality. We rebel in choosing to not put God at the center of our marriages. And, and we do all of this, and then we wonder why our marriages don't last. You see, our rebellion results in brokenness. And, and here at Calvary, we understand that. 
And so we don't stand in a place of saying, hey, you know, you're bad because you've done that. What we're saying is we understand the hurt and we know that God wants to heal it. Because that brokenness and pain are real. And they're destructive. And and I've asked a a friend of mine and a co-minister along with me, a partner in ministry, uh, Chet Anderson, our executive pastor. I've asked him if he would come and share his story, his personal story of pain and brokenness. Chet? I was a 30-year-old, happily married, wife, two children, great career, house, everything going my direction. When I showed up at work one morning having a conversation over the counter with the administrative assistant and a sheriff's deputy came to the door. And she looked at me, the assistant looked at me and said, Chip, what have you done now? And I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure they're here to see you. They're not here to see me. I went through the mental thing. I, I, everything is good. Everything is really good. I don't owe anybody. I haven't shot anybody. I'm, I'm real good. Until the gentleman walked in the door and said, I'm here to see Chester Talmage Anderson, Jr. Present. And I'm thinking, I'm still good, right? I haven't done anything wrong. He said, you have a private place for us to talk? Then the blood started draining out of my face, and we walked to the back of the office to a private room, and he handed me a slip of paper, and he says, I need you to sign this. And I signed it, and I said, what am I signing? He said, "Uh, your wife has filed a petition for divorce to which you could have knocked me down. I mean, literally, he looked at me and said, you weren't expecting this. You didn't see this coming, did you? And I didn't have a clue. Absolutely no clue. Zero. Zilch. Not a no. Nothing. That was the last thing that I was expecting to happen on that Friday morning is that my wife had chosen to end our marriage relationship. And so I said, well, I'm sure this can be worked out because it's one man One woman, as we stood before God and made a covenant to work things out, and and it would be a lifetime commitment. And so being one of the leaders in the church, I was a deacon at this church that uh, Chad was talking about, one of the real dysfunctional churches that we served at. I was also, along with my wife, the young married Sunday school teacher that was there. I was also working with the youth. And I was asked by the church leadership when I said, hey, you guys know I'm bringing this to your attention that I've been served with papers of divorce. I want you to help me process this. I'm sure this is a mistake and it can be worked out. They said, well, the first thing that you need to do is we need you to resign your positions of leadership. And I said, no, no problem. I can understand that. And I said, and here's the other thing that I really want you to do as a church family because I had understood that uh, family helps family. I want you to put together a group of men and women in our church, godly men and women. You pick them. I don't have any say-so in it. My ex, my wife at that time can pick them. It doesn't matter who they are as long as they're godly men and women. And whatever they say I need to do to correct this problem, that's what I'll allow God to do in my life. I was willing to submit to that authority. And they said, we're a little too busy for that right now. You need to get you a lawyer. And so I got a lawyer. And in the state of Georgia, 30 days later, you're divorced. And so I went from a happily married 30-year-old with a family, with a house, with two daughters to a very unhappy, unmarried, no family, no church family, no daughters with a relationship. And I decided the pain was a little too intense. How did I decide that? Here's the deal. When you put Jack Daniels and a revolver together, That's a lethal combination. And I had chosen to self-medicate because I didn't want to deal with the pain. I had failed in the thing that I had prided myself in working at the most. I had failed miserably. And so I'll have the last say. I'll fix her. I'll have the last word. Because really what I was saying is the pain was too much for me to handle. And I want out until a sales manager that I was working with pulled me aside and said, Chet, I want to have a conversation with you. And I'm thinking, oh boy, here we go. Another speech. Somebody trying to get into my business and try to help me, right? And he looks at me and he goes, I want, I want you to hear this really clear. He said, I have a relationship with you for several years, so I think I can speak into your life. He said, I know that you love God. He said, but I've watched you spiral. 
And he said, just because someone says that you are mean and nasty and ugly and unwanted does not mean that you're mean and nasty and unwanted. But you've got to believe that. But the pain in my life was so severe, I couldn't hear those words at that time. See, because of sin, divorce is a reality in this world. And because of sin, divorce is often a result in our marriages. That's the, the struggle, that our rebellion results in brokenness. But here's the good news. God redeems our failures. God redeems our failures. You see it in the, the passage in 1 Corinthians 7 when, when Paul says, look, stay married because you don't know how God's going to use your relationship to change your spouse. You don't know how God's going to show up and, and lead them to that life-changing relationship with Jesus. And, and it, this may sound crazy, but divorce itself can be part of how God redeems. He, he already said through Paul that if they leave, you're excused from the marriage. Jesus spoke to this too. Matthew chapter 19, uh, if you're interested in the passages, uh, verses 8 and 9. He's having a conversation with the Pharisees about divorce. And they ask the question, why did Moses allow us to get divorced? Why did he do it? And here's Jesus' answer. Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for, un for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. Now, I don't know if you caught that or not, but God permitted divorce because our hearts were hard. Because we wouldn't listen to him and we wouldn't change our ways and we wouldn't value our spouses the way that we're supposed to. So, so God said to Moses, you can allow them to, to have the certificate of divorce. And, and notice also that Jesus said there is an exception to this. You need to stay married or else it's sin and, and, and the unfaithfulness side of it. Again, you've got unfaithfulness, you've got abandonment that are causes for terminating a marriage. So if one spouse is unfaithful, the other is not mandated to live their life with a cheat. If one spouse abandons the family, the other is not sentenced to loneliness. If one spouse is abusive, the other is not condemned to a life of fear and torment. That's what God is saying. Hey, look, there is an out, there is an option, there is a second chance. It, just if your spouse gives up or chooses addiction or, or just walks away then you have a second chance. If you will, divorce can be God's way of saying, I didn't create marriage to punish you or to force you to live in misery. If the marriage vows are broken or if one partner has a hard heart, then God gives an out because he's a God of second chances. And that's why we mentioned to you that God redeems our failures because a lot of times we feel like a failure, we feel like we've lost, we feel like we need to give up, and yet God will redeem if we let him. If we let him, if we trust him, if we follow him, if we live his way, he does miracles in our lives. And see, Chet didn't give up, thought about it, was tempted to, but instead he trusted God and he began to see how God could redeem his life. And so Chet, would you finish the story and tell us about the redemption? The key word is trust. It really is, it's trust. And uh, I began to trust God and say, okay, God, you can, you, you can fix me. What, there's got to be somebody out there that wants me, but I really don't want anybody in my life right now. Matter of fact, I was the self-proclaimed president of the He-Man Woman Haters Club because I really didn't need that sort of pain in my life again. But I chose to trust God, and when I chose, chose to trust God, God brought a beautiful young lady into my life, and I knocked on her door one afternoon after calling up for a date and her name is Claudia Rose McCartney and her last name is Anderson now and she sits at the piano at the eight o'clock service and she's in the district and we have been together for 22 years that was the first thing that God said I trust you with a wife you will work on you Chet but I'm going to trust you in a marriage relationship the second thing that God trusted me with and I had to trust God was children. Because you see, she brought into the marriage two beautiful young men that I had the privilege of shaping and being part of their life. And not only two men, James and Michael, but she also, God also brought into my life two beautiful daughters, Caitlin and Carly. 
And that told me that God trusted me with children because, you see, my, my first spouse didn't trust me with children. Matter of fact, went on a campaign to try to ruin my reputation. But God trusted me with children, and I trusted him. The third thing that God did to redeem the relationship, and I'm not encouraging you to go through a divorce so that you can get the redemption. Chad's been talking about the the win of not having to go through that. But as a result of the pain, nine years ago, just about this time of the year, I received a call from Calvary Baptist Church that said, we want to talk to somebody about being our administrator. And I got to be part of an interview process, and God allowed me to come to Lake Havasu City, Arizona, and be the executive pastor at Calvary Baptist Church. That was the third thing that God trusted me with. All of the things that had been taken away, family, children, and ministry, God trusted me with again because I chose to trust God. Now here's a word. Some of you are sitting out here today. Men, I'm specifically talking to you. Because God gave me a second chance, if you've been around me very much, you're going to hear me talk about my wife because I love Claudia with all my heart, mind, and soul. Same way I love God, just in the right direction. But here's the deal, guys. Every morning when you wake up, Every opportunity when you wake up and you look at that beautiful wife that God has entrusted you with, you ask God to teach you, bring people in your life, look at God's word, and to teach you how you can love her more in a godly manner than you loved her the day before. It's a true testimony. 22 years I've been trusting God to wake me up and have Claudia right next to me and teach me how to build a relationship that is honoring to God. It will work. Amen. Amen. See, God redeems our failures. He never wants us to experience divorce, but if we do, he redeems. And we want you to know this today. No matter what your choices have been, no matter what your failures uh, have been, whatever struggles you've had to this point in your life, God will redeem. God will forgive. God will restore if you let him, if you trust him, if you follow him with your life. You may be sitting here and your marriage may be struggling. You may be the one who's pondering, is it going to last? And I just want you to know this. God can redeem and restore your relationship. He can do that if you will trust him. If two partners will both commit themselves to God and to each other, God can rebirth and renew that relationship. You may be sitting there thinking, yeah, but I just don't love them anymore like I used to. doesn't matter. God can give you better love than you've ever loved them before. If you'll trust him and if you'll commit yourself to him. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's going to be quick. But if you'll walk that path together, then God can redeem and restore. You may have to learn some things. You may have to grow in some knowledge. You may have to change a lot of stuff. But he can do this if you'll let him. Now, notice I said if two partners are willing to do that. Because if just one is committed to that, it may not work. Chet was willing. He walked into the the church, to the leadership, and said, I will do whatever it takes. But his ex-wife wasn't willing. She already had someone else. She wasn't willing to work at it. She wasn't willing to even consider it. And so his marriage ended and he couldn't help that but God redeems and so if you're here today and your marriage is already broken it's already ended it's already over understand that God redeems and he wants to bless you but here's the challenge you've got to do it his way this time you've got to commit yourself to him and say God teach me your values teach me how to relate the way that you want and I'm going to do this from beginning to end in a way that honors Christ and so that you can bless me which means that you Take on the values that God has. And you look for somebody who loves God like you do. And it means that you conduct yourself in a way that honors Christ, including how you date and your morality. It doesn't matter what the culture says. And you allow God to lead your life into that place of blessing. Not saying it's going to play out exactly the way that Chet's did, but I'm going to say this. God's going to surprise you with the goodness that he brings into your life because he's going to heal you and he's going to heal relationships. He's going to restore the love in your life. If you will surrender to God's plans for how to live your life. But here's the hardest part. Hardest part is letting go of the past failures so that you can move forward into God's future. 
So there's a lot of us who, when, when we're, we fail, when we struggle, then we just camp out there in that misery, in that regret, and we kind of live there, and Satan loves that. He wants you to live in your guilt. He wants you to live in your shame. He wants you to live in your failure. And, and quite honestly, that's part of the reason that we'll stand up here and tell you what kind of failures we've been, because we know that Satan wants to keep you there, trap you there. And, and I want you to know that a life of regret is a miserable trap. It's a miserable trap. But hope that is immersed in obedience will lead you to the joy of redemption. You see, Satan wants you to be miserable and lives thinking, if only, if only, if only I'd done this. If that only that had happened. But if you have hope that is immersed in obedience, not just hope that, oh, I hope this happens or I hope that happens, but hope that is taken and given over to God and say, God, I'm going to follow you with my life, with my choices, with my values, with my relationships, then that kind of hope that is given over to God in obedience will result in joy, will result in redemption. You ever wonder why Chet grins like an idiot? It's because he experienced the joy of redemption. He doesn't grin like an idiot. It's because he knows the joy of God redeeming his life. He just told you that story, and, and you know, he tell you, he'd tell you more of it. But here's the thing that I know. He stopped dwelling on the past. In fact, when, we, when I talked to him about sharing this, he's like, he didn't remember a lot of stuff. I did. He didn't. Because he'd gone ahead and stepped into God's future. So you got to make a choice today. How are you going to live your life? Are you going to cling to the failures of the past and, and just dwell on that and let it poison your life and, and go on living in that destruction? Or are you going to go ahead and accept God's grace and his forgiveness and his mercy and step into that place of obedience so that you can see how he will redeem your failures? Pray with me. God, we love you. And we thank you for the grace of Jesus Christ. We don't deserve it, but we thank you and we rejoice in it. And Father, I pray for our, our families. I pray for our marriages right now, that you'd strengthen every one of them that exists in this church, that you would bless husbands to love their wives and wives to love their husbands and make them strong families. God, when, when our marriages fail, though, I pray that you would visit grace and mercy upon them and you would teach them and show them your love and your redemption. Let them know that life is not over and you do not hate them, but instead you have mercy for them because your heart is broken with them. And God, help us to be that place that points people to Jesus Christ, men and women, boys and girls, husbands and fathers and kids, so that they can know the power of your goodness and your grace. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God.